are in this space with Marcy and me because we are fully immunized now and we want to celebrate that we can be closer together and you will be closer in time. Whether you are in Chandler, whether you are in Phoenix or in Arizona or in another state or another country, you are part of Valley Unitarian Universalist community for the next hour. And we hope that it will be an enriching time for you. When people ask what kind of a place this is, you can say a lot of words, but it comes down to three things. This is a place where we seek to free our minds with a truth that's larger than we know, to grow our souls to their fullest and broadest and deepest capacity, and to change the world in ways that admit for greater liberty and justice and hope. That's why we're here. And now, because this is not the act of worship, but because we are summoned by the flame of our flaming chalice, I'm inviting Rebecca Riggs, our worship associate today, to light the chalice and begin our time of worship together. Good morning. I am Rebecca Riggs. And for those of you who continue the ritual of lighting a chalice while at home, now is the time to bring your chalice close. I ask you all to join me in saying our chalice lighting words as I light the flame, a spark of light and hope to begin our service. We kindle this flame, symbol of our faith, for the light of truth, the warmth of community, and the fire of love, which calls us to work for justice. So good morning, everyone. I am Marcy Bowden, your Faith Formation Director here at Valley UU. If you have any children in your house, now is the time to call them forward in front of your device so they can join us for our Time for All Ages. A couple of reminders while we wait. Don't forget that we have our in-person in socially distanced Easter event coming up next Sunday afternoon. You need to register for it. The link is in the happenings, or you can contact me at faithform at, at vuu.org. Our pastoral care associate this week is Randy Galbraith. You can reach them via email at pastoralcare at vuu.org, or you can use the Zoom chat to send them a private message. Just look for Randy's name in the options. Remember that the chat is restricted during the prayer, meditation, and sermon, so please feel free to post and chat your joys and concerns before and after those parts of the service. Other meeting reminders that you can find more information in the happenings would be there will be working in the garden this Thursday morning starting at 8 o'clock. Due to the influx of refugees and asylum seekers, our immigration team is requesting a bunch of different items. They are specifically enumerated in the happenings. But Thursday is the last day to drop off in the sanctuary, I mean, in the office foyer. Food for Life also has a meeting this week, Friday at 10 a.m. We will be having a congregational conversation on April 11th, immediately following service. So don't forget to put that on your calendar to stick around. So my Time for All Ages today is one of my favorite books called The Three Questions based on Leo Tolstoy's inspiring short story about compassion and being engaged in each moment. John J. Muth transformed this story into a timeless fable for young audiences, but you may recognize that the characters' names have been borrowed from history. For example, Nikolai was Tolstoy's brother, but is also the author's son. Pushkin and Gogol were both famous Russian writers. Sonia was Tolstoy's wife. And Leo, of course, is Tolstoy. I hope you enjoy this story. The Three Questions, based on a story by Leo Tolstoy, written and illustrated by John J. Muth. There once was a boy named Nikolai who sometimes felt uncertain about the right way to act. I want to be a good person, he told his friends, but I don't always know the best way to do that. Nikolai's friends understood and they wanted to help him. If only I could find the answers to my three questions, Nikolai continued, then I would always know what to do. When is the best time to do things? Who is the most important one? 
what is the right thing to do? Nikolai's friends considered his first question. Then Sonia, the heron, spoke. To know the best time to do things, one must plan in advance, she said. Gogol, the monkey, who had been rooting through some leaves to find something good to eat, said, you will know when to do things if you watch and pay close attention. Then Pushkin, the dog, who was just dozing off, rolled over and said, you can't pay attention to everything yourself. You need a pack to keep watch and help you decide when to do things. For example, Gogol, a coconut is about to fall on your head. Nikolai thought for a moment. Then he asked his second question. Who is the most important one? Those who are closest to heaven, said Sonia, circling up into the sky. Those who know how to heal the sick, said Gogol, stroking his bruised noggin. Those who make the rules, growled Pushkin. Nikolai thought some more. Then he asked the third question. What is the right thing to do? Flying, said Sonia. Having fun all the time, laughed Gogol. Fighting, barked Pushkin right away. Then the boy thought for a long while. He loved his friends. He knew they were all trying their best to help him answer his questions. But their answers didn't seem quite right. Then an idea came to him. I know, he thought. I will ask Leo the turtle. He has lived a very long time. Surely he will know the answers I am looking for. Nikolai hiked up into the mountains where the old turtle lived all alone. When Nikolai arrived, he found Leo digging a garden. The turtle was old and digging was hard for him. I have three questions and I came to ask for your help, Nikolai said. When is the best time to do things? Who is the most important one? And what is the right thing to do? Leo listened carefully, but he only smiled. Then he went on with his digging. You must be tired, Nikolai said at last. Let me help you. The turtle gave him his shovel and thanked him. And because it was easier for a young boy to dig than it was for an old turtle, Nikolai kept on digging until the rows were finished. But just as he finished, the wind blew wildly and rain burst from darkened clouds. As they moved toward the cottage for shelter, Nikolai suddenly heard a cry for help. Running down the path, he found a panda whose leg had been injured by a fallen tree. Carefully, Nikolai carried her into Leo's house and made a splint for her leg with a stick of bamboo. The storm raged on, banging at the doors and windows. The panda woke up. Where am I, she said, and where is my child? The boy ran out of the cottage and down the path. The roar of the storm was deafening. Pushing against the howling wind and drenching rain, he ran farther into the forest. There he found the panda's child, cold and shivering on the ground. The little panda was wet and scared, but alive. Nikolai carried her inside and made her warm and dry, and then laid her in her mother's arms. Leo smiled when he saw what the boy had done. The next morning, the sun was warm, birds sang, and all was well with the world. The panda's leg was healing nicely, and she thanked Nikolai for saving her and her baby from the storm. At that moment, Sonia, Gogol, and Pushkin arrived to make sure everyone was all right. Nikolai felt great peace within himself. He had wonderful friends, and he had saved the panda and her child. But he also felt disappointed. He still had not found the answers to his three questions. So he asked Leo one more time. The old turtle looked at the boy. But your questions have been answered, he said. They have, asked the boy. Yesterday, if you had not stayed to help me dig my garden, you wouldn't have heard the panda's cries for help in the storm. Therefore, the most important time was the time you spent digging the garden. The most important one at that moment was me. And the most important thing to do was to help me with the garden. Later, when you found the injured panda, the most important time was the time you spent mending her leg and saving her child. 
The most important ones were the panda and her baby, and the most important thing to do was to take care of them and make them safe. Remember that there is only one important time, and that time is now. And the most important one is always the one you are with. And the most important thing is to do good for the one who is standing at your side. For these, my dear boy, are the answers to what is most important in the world. This is why we are here. And now it's time to sing together. Our opening hymn this morning is an African-American spiritual that assures us there is more love, more hope, more peace and joy somewhere. Our job is to keep on working and searching until we find it. Please join in singing this hopeful and familiar song, There Is More Love Somewhere. It's number 95 in our hymnal. Please join in. Good morning again, and welcome to Valley UU. During these challenging times of physical distancing, we hope you will continue to find an online spiritual home here at VUU, a place for religious exploration, a social hub, a place from which to work for social justice, or simply a place from which to feel connected and involved. It's wonderful to see you all here this morning. And for any visitors, we extend a special welcome to you. It's sometimes hard to connect virtually when you are new, but we hope that you will stay during the breakout group time at the end of the service, staying right here and not joining a group You'll stay here and meet with Reverend Wooden and a few others who can welcome you more fully. Thank you all for joining us this morning. When I realized that I was to be worship associate for when the Reverend Wooden was planning on talking about James Weldon Johnson's last poem about the final judgment, I panicked a little. 
I read the poem and it made my toes curl. <clears throat> it, it did not resonate with me at all. Don't worry about it. <laughs> and I had no idea what to say. But then I started thinking about judgment in a more general sense and thinking of my years of teaching high school students. I spent my career around teenagers and as a group, they're very vulnerable, although they hate to show it. And they can be very judgmental while at the same time incredibly sensitive to the harsh judgments of others. I talked to kids who felt judged harshly for their body type, which did not fit society's standards for beautiful or handsome. I knew kids who felt judged as not smart enough or conversely, so smart that there was no room for failure. Kids expressed worry about judgment over their sexual orientation or their shyness or their lack of athletic ability or their home life, which didn't leave a lot of room for much of a social life or judged for their eccentricities, which made them that terrible thing different. The feeling of being judged is strong at that age. And it often continues when we leave the teenage years behind. So I was particularly pleased when I saw this bumper sticker just a few weeks ago. It said, non-judgment day is coming. It's probably the classic liberal retort to the conservative Christian idea that there is a day approaching often thought to be in the very near future, when everyone is finally going to be called to account for their sins. But wouldn't it be nice if our response could be to stress the need for non-judgment in our world, to work toward a day when we will not be judged. Instead, we will be seen and accepted for who we really are, we will no longer be judged not for our beliefs, not for our gender, not for our eccentricities, not for the color of our skin or the language we speak. We hope and we work so that day is coming. Now, I'm well aware that we all make judgments at times. And it's inescapable and not necessarily bad. When that judgment is focused on institutions that allow for systemic income inequality, educational inequality, racism, sexism, homophobia, etc., that judgment followed by action is needed. But in this season of Lent, even though I realize it's almost over, what if we were to give up something really hard, not chocolate, but something even harder, like personally directed judgment? That's the challenge I submit today. Let's see if we can start on a path to a coming non-judgment day. So again, welcome to you all here at Coming to Valley UU. We hope this morning's service speaks to your mind and your heart. And please know that we are so glad that this morning you've chosen to be part of this wonderful community. Welcome. So my uh, phone, uh, well, it's having a good time with me today. Uh, but one of the fun things that happened was that earlier this week, I got a, a message uh, apparently from the US government saying, uh, 
my stimulus check had arrived in my bank account. And lo and behold, it had. And I thought of that word stimulus. They want me to stimulate the economy, but you know, I'm more interested in stimulating morality, decency, liberty, curiosity. So I'm going to park some of that money here at PUU because the thing I want to stimulate are the better angels of our nature, as Lincoln called them. And maybe you want to do that too. And this is over and above to something I have pledged. You can click, you can text, you can write. As I've said before, if you want to hold that check out to your front door, I'll come by with a pair of tongs and take it happily on the, over to the office, however you can, however much you can. But think about stimulating the better angels of our nature. Stimulate be you, you. You know it's the right thing to do. And now we begin our time of centering. We go back, we go back to the basics of what keeps us grounded and connected our breathing. May we be conscious, at least for this brief time, of breathing in peace and breathing out love. As we join in this meditation on breathing, led by Katie and Andrew Seifert. That's a really, a really refreshing, grounding piece of music, isn't it? You may be able to see, thanks to the camera here in the sanctuary, there's something over here, and that's our bridge. 
it doesn't go from one place to another. It goes from one person to another. Our young people, as they come of age, symbolically walk across it. And they're going to be doing that in a few weeks as part of that transition from youth toward adulthood. I mean toward, because even we grown-ups still have a lot of growing up to do. And what is this to do with a prayer? Prayer is looking for the next bridge. It is scouting within, listening without, for that step that takes you to the next person you're going to be, the next version of yourself. So as you take in that breath and let it go, picture, hear, feel, touch that person you're on the way to becoming. Will it be more patient, more kind, more fervent, more committed? You know who you are becoming, or you know part of who you are becoming. Look across the bridge. See who is waiting there. Imagine what it will be like to cross that open space between knowing and becoming the, the empty space in between of not knowing and that's prayer. On this Palm Sunday in the Christian tradition, when a fabled man took a fabled journey on a small animal, that was a bridge from what was to what will be. In the midst of the Passover celebration going on now, there was the bridge that went from Egypt into the wilderness. So many bridges, and each taking us into a wilderness, rich and unknown and full of pregnant possibilities. This is what it means to pray. And amen. I'm sorry. <laughs> Our special music this morning comes from the African American spiritual tradition. Oh, my Lord, what a morning when the stars begin to fall. I'm soon to quit my worldly ways. These few words conjure up images of the end times with stars falling and quitting the world. Maybe you can even hear a call in the last judgment for reconciliation. Please listen with an open heart to our special music, My Lord, What a Morning, performed by the group DEM. My Lord, what a morning, 
I'm up here on South Mountain uh, with these ragged and sturdy rocks behind me. Because that seemed like the right place to be to read James Baldwin Johnson's poem, The Judgment Day. Let's see how it works out. In that great day, people in that great day, God's gonna rain down fire. Gods are going to sit in the middle of the air to judge the people of the dead. Early one of these mornings, the gods are going to call for Gabriel, that tall, bright angel Gabriel. And gods are going to say to him, Gabriel, blow your silver trumpet and wake the living nations. And Gabriel's going to ask him, Lord, how loud must I blow it? And gods are going to tell him, Gabriel, Blow it calm and easy. Then putting one foot on the mountaintop and another in the middle of the sea, Gabriel's going to stand and blow his horn to wake the living nations. Then God's going to say to him, Gabriel, once more blow that silver trumpet and wake the nations underground. And Gabriel's going to ask him, Lord, how loud must I blow it? God's going to tell him, Gabriel, like seven peals of thunder. Then the tall, bright angel Gabriel will put one foot on the battlements of heaven and the other on the steps of hell and blow that silver trumpet till he shakes old hell's foundations. And I feel old earth a-shuddering. I see the graves are bursting, and I hear a sound, blood-chilling sound. What sound is that I hear? It's the clicking together of the dry bones, bone to bone, the 
the tribe. I see coming out of the bursting graves and marching up from the valley of death, the army of the dead. And the living and the dead, in the twinkling of an eye, are caught up in the middle of the air before God's judgment bar. Oh, sinner, where will you stand? in that great day when gods are going to rain down fire. Oh, you gambling man, where will you stand? You whoremongering man, where will you stand? Liars and backsliders, where will you stand in that great day when gods are going to rain down fire? And God will divide the sheep from the goats, the one on the right, the other on the left and to them on the right God's going to say enter into my kingdom and those who've come through great tribulations and washed their robes in the blood of the lamb they will enter in clothed in spotless white with starry crowns upon their head and silver slippers on their feet and harps within their hands, and two by two they'll walk up and down the golden street, feasting on the milk and honey, singing new songs of Zion, chattering with the angels all around the great white throne. And to them on the left, God's going to say, depart from me into everlasting darkness, down into the bottomless pit. And the wicked, like lumps of lead, will start to fall. Headlong for seven days and nights they'll fall. Plumb into the big, black, red-hot mouth of hell. Belching out fire and brimstone. And their cries, like howling, yelping dogs, will go up with the fire and smoke from hell. But God will stop his ears. Too late, sinner. Too late. Goodbye, sinner. Goodbye. In hell, sinner. In hell. Beyond the reach of the love of God. And I hear a voice crying, Time shall be no more. Time shall be no more. Time shall be no more. And the sun will go out like a candle in the wind. The moon turn to dripping blood, the stars will fall like cinders, and the sea will burn like tar, and the earth shall melt away and be dissolved, and the sky will roll up like a scroll, and with a wave of his hand, God will blot out time and start the wheel of eternity. Sinner, oh sinner. Where will you stand in that day? So how is he going to make that work? I mean, we're in a liberal faith. We expect a certain amount of diversity, eccentricity in people's beliefs. It's okay. But even I have, if not limits, let's call them uh, struggles with certain ideas. I think of a conversation <clears throat> with a now deceased colleague that surprised my ears. You, you, minister friend, were at a party, was at my parents' house. He said in a whisper, you want to know something? I leaned in my ear. This would shock people. I leaned closer. I believe in the resurrection of the body. Few things could be more at odds with our rational religion than the idea of a bodily resurrection. So what set me to thinking? Asking myself why he could believe in that and why 
I did not. Without assuming that he was absolutely wrong and that I was absolutely right. That's what these poems of James Weldon Johnson do. These Negro sermons and verses, he calls them, proclaim things that we would find dubious, troubling, even outrageous. But they also portray at the same time the spiritual world of many Black Americans, a spiritual world that has sustained them through immense suffering, struggle, and loss. When I was a political candidate back in 2018, I, I went to a lot of Black churches to shake hands and be seen and listen to a whole lot of sermons, uh, a lot of them very like the one you just heard. And while Johnson may be a genuine poet, and he is, he did not stray far from the poetry I heard in the Black pulpit. Cognitive dissonance, that's what I was experiencing with my colleague and when I was in those churches. Cognitive dissonance is the fancy term for two facts that cannot be true at the same time. This whole series has been my deliberate effort to cultivate cognitive dissonance in you. Each week has been a little harder than the last. There was the majestic poem of the creation, the fine fable of Noah built the ark. Let my people go, boy, and the prodigal son, and last week go down death. And each one evoked images that were a little harder to take seriously, raising your spiritual temperature, as it were, daring us to take those hoary biblical stories seriously, stories which we largely reject and for understandable reasons. And now we're at Judgment Day. The very idea makes no sense. Talk about cognitive dissonance. What possible truth could there be in this apocalyptic fever dream that is so dear to so many religious fanatics and fundamentalists. Then I thought back to my UU clergy comrade. I loved this man. He was an early mentor as I was considering seminary, who gave me his pulpit to preach one of my first sermons, who eulogized my father. But I was nonetheless repelled by the idea he held. To believe in the resurrection is the same intellectually as believing the world is flat, right? How could this man I know to be an educated, informed, reasonable, rational, Unitarian Universalist believe in that? Okay, to be sure, the promise of the resurrection assuages that very real fear of dissolving into nothing, which we know is in every future. It's hard to live a meaningful life when the universe says you are but dust and ashes. So I get it. So I was repelled by the idea, but also compelled to take the issue behind it seriously. And as I've learned from experience, when you find yourself torn, when you're stuck in cognitive dissonance, you are standing on some kind of holy ground because you cannot give up either. Something of primary importance is at stake, but it's not the thing I think. So let's look at the poem itself just a little bit because it compresses a lot of images from across a dozen books of the Bible into one story. There's the blowing of the trumpet, the valley of the dry bones, being caught up in the air, sheep and goats, bottomless pits, omens, portents, Suns going out, blood in the sky. These images appear in the great spiritual you heard earlier, My Lord, What a Morning, where it tells of the trumpets waking the nations underground and the stars begin to fall. It's a very touching song, but the imagery is rather harrowing. I looked into the history of the spiritual, which 
seems to have emerged uh, in the North among free blacks first, but was carried by word of mouth South. And the original word mourning was spelled with a U as in grief. But as it moved further south and went from ear to ear, it became morning as in new day. This is partly because they sound so much alike. But I think also because for that enslaved community, the last judgment would bring an end to their suffering and an end to injustice. It would be a new day for them. The great writer of African-American thought 100 years ago, W.E.B. Du Bois, wrote of it in this way, quote, through all the sorrow of the sorrow songs, which is what he calls the spirituals, there breathes a hope, a faith in the ultimate justice of things. The minor cadences of despair change often to triumph and calm confidence. Sometimes it is a faith in life, sometimes a faith in death, sometimes assurance of boundless justice in some fair world beyond. But whichever it is, the meaning is always clear that sometime, somewhere, people will judge people by their souls and not by their skins. Okay, that helps. That helps explain its power to that community. Last judgment is the ultimate bend in that famous arc of justice when it lands. And I want more. I want it to mean something to me. Is that even possible? And I feel old earth a shuddering and I see the graves a bursting and I hear a sound, a loud chilling sound. What sound is that I hear, says Johnson. It's the clicking together of the dry bones, bone to bone, the dry bones. And I see coming out of the bursting graves and marching up from the valley of death, the army of the dead. This creepy image is not in Revelation, and it's not about the last judgment, actually. It comes from an older Hebrew prophet, Ezekiel, who had this vision that God, and I quote from the scripture now, brought me out and set me in the midst of a valley. It was full of bones. God said to me, prophesy to the bones. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and I prophesied, and as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to bone. And I looked, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then God said, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus saith God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. So I prophesied, and the breath came into them, and they lived. Well, first of all, what horror movie maker wouldn't love to stage that scene? And I guess they often have. The picture is about as chilling as it gets. The ground splits open and the bones shimmy toward another click, 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 together. Then the sinew grows, slithering weirdly down the bone, and then more flesh, a reverse dissection, and twice as grisly. And finally, the pallor in. So there they stood lifeless because, as he said, there was no breath in them. In horror movie parlance, God has created an army of zombies. And like all horror movies, it is fearful and yet weirdly fascinating. The idea repels and compels at the same time. It is cognitively dissonant. 
No wonder preachers love preaching on it. No wonder it made its way into its own spiritual. You've heard it, them bones, them bones, them dry bones. Johnson's subject is the judgment day, but Ezekiel's vision, as I said, has nothing to do with that. He's pulling all these images together. It is a resurrection though, but it is not a literal one. It is symbolic because Ezekiel goes on, God said to me, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Oh, okay, it's symbolic. Behold, they say our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. Therefore prophesy and say to them, I will raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you home to the land of Israel. So resurrection, even in the Bible, is symbolic. In this case, portraying the nation of Israel coming out of spiritual death back to spiritual life. And even Paul, who gave us the trumpets and the meeting in the air says of that same resurrection, that same idea, you do not sow the body that is to be, but a seed. It is sown a physical body, it is raised a spiritual body. Wow. That's a relief. We're not talking about the zombie form at all. We're talking about something else, but that really doesn't solve the problem. And I still have my friend. He is smart. He's educated, sensitive, wise, the very model of a model Unitarian. And there are a host of scholars, great minds, all with PhDs in abundance, who at least affirm some idea of resurrection. In fact, let's be honest, all of us good skeptical liberals, most people on the world believe in some kind of resurrection because when you put all the Christians and Jews and Muslims together, you've got most of the world's people. We are outnumbered. Are they fools or are we the only wise ones? What my friend confesses, what billions believe, what Ezekiel and Johnson express, though, share something that we may have overlooked. They use impossibilities to express ultimacy. And here is my point for, the, for this morning. Whatever is sacred must, at least in our minds and hearts, exceed all human boundaries to convey the immensity the awesomeness we must overreach the real or the unreal and what is more unreal beyond belief outlandish than resurrection we human beings crave a spiritual hope that knows no boundaries Whatever you believe, for you must be boundless. Expressing that naturally leads to a language of excess. Remember when you were a kid and your dad was bigger than all the other dads? Think of all the people who proclaim how great America is better than all the other countries. The language of excess is the language of hope well or poorly placed. And resurrection is about the most impossible claim there is. No wonder half the world claims it, claims it. On judgment day, they believe the living and the dead and the twinkling of an eye are caught up in the middle of the air before God's judgment bar. As Johnson says, the good will be rewarded and the wicked punished and justice will be done. And now I have a problem. I mean, I kind of get the extravagance of the idea. I kind of get the existential appeal. I kind of get that. But then we get to this boats and sheep thing, this sending people to hell and sending other people to heaven. I can't go there. It seems really out of character that any God who can blow out the sun like a candle and scatter the stars like sand and resurrect the dead, there you go, would be eternally offended by the mischief of mere human beings, no matter how dreadful. That's really way too petty for a boundless God, don't you think? 
That's exactly the point one of our great spiritual ancestors made, Hosea Ballou, out there in the wilds of Massachusetts, once asked rhetorically, of course, can an infinite being be infinitely offended by the finite sins of a finite being? If so, he writes, the finite being has infinite power and that is nonsense. If the resurrection, if the resurrection makes no sense, judgment, eternal damnation makes even less sense than resurrection. Yeah, we all want to know that the bad guy has to pay in the end. We all want that kind of justice done. But our human need for justice is not cosmic. Why should God see it that way? Why should the universe see it that way? When you think about it, divine judgment really does confine any God worth believing in, binds the infinite to our finite notions of justice. Any God who can give life to dry bones can certainly cut the sinners of the world a little more slack, don't you think? The power of resurrection then is wasted in the last judgment, which is why I cannot agree with that line beyond the reach of the love of God. A truly eternal and infinite power is nothing beyond its reach. Everything and everyone is within reach. Hosea Ballou preached this gospel his whole life and got into serious trouble for it. No one is beyond God's love and therefore all will be redeemed, none will be damned, and they called him and his fellow heretics universalists for preaching universal salvation. It wasn't easy. There was and always is that question about bad people getting off. Why should you be good if you're going to enjoy eternal bliss? But we don't know what lies beyond. What we're saying is that whatever there is, we're all there. Where is the justness and the rightness and saying even the wicked will be saved? Well, I know that runs against common sense. It's outlandish, it's crazy, it makes no sense, but so does resurrection. And why is that easier to believe than universal redemption? Every age proclaims ultimate hope in its own way. And all of them will be impossible at that moment because we need the impossible to express the infinite. Yes, once it was immortality or resurrection, but this age needs a new impossibility. Perhaps the one that says all are loved, no matter what. That no matter our sins and crimes, they can be forgiven and repaired that we are all loved eternally. I know that's hard for rational people to say, but I think it's not hard for human people to feel. Are any of you human people? I think you know what I mean. And that is our heritage. Our heritage is that hope of an infinite and immortal love that none lie beyond its reach. Yes, it is a metaphor like resurrection. It is not literal, but like resurrection, universal redemption is a lens of the heart through which we focus our mind. Forget whether it is literally true. The truth behind it will be heard down in the valley among the dry bones, it will be heard by those who hunger and thirst for a vision so huge that they cannot help but wish for it. Look around in our world, comrades. Can these bones live? Yes, but you and I have to be the Ezekiel. We have to prophesy the good news the good news of a love, a truth, a justice that knows no bounds.
So prophesy to the bones of the world, friends, with your words, with your deeds, with your presence. Prophesy to the dry bones and the desert surround us. And if we all do that, they may yet live. Amen. And so be it. Rebecca, can you introduce our closing hymn for us? Yes, thank you, Fred. Our closing song is one of our favorites. We sing of giving thanks for the waves which uphold us, questions we are free to cast into the unknown depths, drifting with our ship's companions which comforts us, and knowing we are all kindred pilgrim souls which connects us. Please add your voice to the Peter Mare song, Blue Boat Home. <laughs> Final words before we extinguish the chalice. From of all people, Mr. Paul, that guy, who said, do not be conformed to this world, amen to that, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Isn't that what we're about? But he goes on elsewhere and says, keep alert. Stand firm in your hope and faith. Be courageous, be strong. But most important, let all that you do, advice to be had, there it is. We'll come back again next week and see how well we've done. It will be Easter, and I have an even more difficult message next week. But for now, Rebecca, can you help us conclude our hour of worship by helping us extinguish the challenge? Of course. Please say our chalice extinguishing words 
as I blow out the flame. Though we extinguish the chalice, our connection to each other and this community remains. May its light guide us this week as we walk the path of justice, speak words of love, and fill our world with compassion until we meet again. For those of you who need to leave now, please have a wonderful week. We hope to see you all next Sunday for Easter. For those who can stay a while longer, you'll be asked to join one of our breakout groups in just a few minutes, where you can visit with a few others of our wonderful community on a little more intimate scale. And for our visitors, just stay right where you are. Do not join the group that you are invited to. We'll visit with you here. Relax and enjoy the beautiful cello music by Barbara Metz as the breakout rooms are set up. A reminder of our question for today, do you have an outlandish, impossible hope in your life? Peace and blessings to you all. Thank uh you. -huh.